Hello, hello, hello. This is the Vanilla JavaScript Podcast. I'm Chris Ferdinandi. Thanks for joining me. Today, I wanted to talk about how the web is actually getting slower. Just a quick note before we jump in. If you learn best by working on projects but struggle to come up with ideas or wish you had someone to just help you get unstuck, you'll love my Vanilla JavaScript Academy training program. Every other day, you get a short lesson, uh, maybe two, and a project to work on. On the in-between days, I share how I approach the project and common issues people run into. You can think of this almost as like a structured 100 days of code challenge. Every other week, you can join video office hours to ask questions, and there's also a private Slack channel where you can share your work in progress, chat with other students, and help get past roadblocks if you run into any, ask quick questions, things like that. A new session of Academy kicks off on January 6th, and as a listener of this podcast, you can take 30% off with the code PODCAST at checkout. Visit VanillaJSAcademy.com to learn more. All right, let's dig in. So um, early in November, maybe end of October, Alex Russell, uh, developer on the Google Chrome team, tweeted out, here's a good way to think about the explosive growth of mid and low end mobile, which will continue for the next four to five years. It is very likely that over the course of your working career, computers and networks have on average gotten slower. If it feels as though computing continues to get faster, it means that you are pulling away from the median. Your experience is no longer representative and you'll have to do real work to stay in touch with your users. And yes, if you're front end, that work is your job. Now, this resonates with me so strongly because I see us continuing to throw more and more code at the things we build. Apps are getting builder. The amount of JavaScript heavy stuff we're building becomes greater and greater. And the common defense of these things that I hear is that, you know, the smartphones that we carry in our pockets, these crazy mobile computers we have with us all the time are getting more and more powerful. And they are, the new iPhone is just blazingly fast. And internet connections in a lot of the world are getting faster and faster. My high-speed fiber optic internet connection is crazy fast. But my experience and the devices that I use to access the web aren't really representative of a majority of the people using the web, and in particular, a majority of the people who are coming onto the web. So the next billion users or so are more likely joining the web on spotty mobile connections, slower connections that are not, you know, 50 megabyte, megabit per second plus up down speeds. They're not using the latest iPhone. They're not necessarily even using the latest Android phone. They're maybe using some slightly underpowered feature phones that are much lower in cost. And if we continue to build things the way we're building them today, that means those people aren't going to be able to use the things we build. And a website failing may not feel like a big deal, like, you know, you're not a doctor, this is not necessarily a life or death situation, but like, what if it is? So what about a critical service? What about an emergency? Um, in the article, Location, Privilege, and Performant Websites, which I'm going to link to down in the show notes, Stephanie Stymek wrote, I was later proved wrong, though, about not having to worry about data and cell coverage. The power went out, and with it, internet connectivity. Now, in this article, Stephanie's talking about how she had just moved to a new area where the, um, the her cell phone coverage was a little spotty, but she had access to you know wired internet, so she didn't think it was that big a deal. Windstorms and even a hard rain can knock the power out where I live, she continues. And in the winter, it's a somewhat common occurrence. For the most part, power is restored within an hour or two, but there have been a few severe windstorms, and one was so severe last February that the wind woke me at 2.30 in the morning. While I ran upstairs to try and assess what was happening outside with branches snapping and loud booms of trees falling in the distance, I attempted to reach the Puget Sound Energy website on my mobile browser to report the outage. I refreshed the page multiple times while my phone said I had data coverage and was on the network. One maybe two bars at a time. But the PSE page came up as offline. 
I finally managed to get the page lo- to load to report the outage after about five minutes. In the morning, the power was still out and it was clear that this had been a devastating windstorm. Electrical fires were being started by downed power lines. Trees were blocking two out of the three exits out of the neighborhood. Since I didn't have a generator for my home, I was without power and internet for nor- nearly 24 hours. Many updates were being posted on Facebook and Twitter, but those struggled to load just as the PSE outage listing page did. I couldn't access the information I needed about repairs or status of the repairs. It was frustrating and isolating. And you can imagine what this is like, right? Like we build these sites that are so dependent on so much JavaScript and those files take so much longer to, to download, to parse, to render. It means the critical websites and online services that people depend on just don't work when we need them to most. And here's the thing, you're a web professional. Building websites that work for as many people as possible is your job, period. Even when their connections are slow and spotty. You're not building for just the people who have the fastest connections and the best devices. If you are, you're a hobbyist, you are not a professional. The web has always been a medium over which we have no control. Honestly, it's what I find so damn exciting about the work we do. Acknowledging that and planning for the things that we can't control results in a better, more resilient web for everyone. Now, as a follow-up to this tweet that Alex Russell had originally shared, he had some follow-up thoughts. Uh, A couple days later, he wrote, we should, as a community, come up with some shared principles around what it means to do front-end professionally. Alex attempted to distill his thoughts down into four principles. Number one, if you are not a front-end special, uh, specialist, choose the most conservative tools. For example, semantic HTML and CSS that can plausibly do the job. So rather than throwing fancy tools at it, frameworks, more JavaScript, choose, he says conservative, but I think maybe the most basic or simple is perhaps a more clear way to articulate this. As little tooling as you can use to get the job done. Number two, the experience of the user matters more than the experience of the developer. This is a hard pill to swallow for a lot of developers. Um, For some reason, it's just really uncomfortable to come to terms with the fact that what makes your life easier is not the most important thing about the work you do. It's your users, first and foremost, period. That's what makes you a web professional. Number three, Front-enders must value and work to improve P75 and P90 lanes as much or more than P50 or P25. Now, um, uh, those numbers, the P numbers, are speed percentages. Um, So P90 is the 90th percentile, some of the slowest internet speeds. Well, P25 refers to the top 25% of internet speeds and connections. So Alex is saying that we need to be focusing on the slowest 25 to 10% and not the fastest half or quarter, which is kind of what we do today. And finally, number four, it is a front ender's responsibility to advocate for expanding access to the products or services we build UIs for. So rather than building for just the latest and greatest, we should be fighting to give as many people access to the stuff we build as possible. And this reminds me a bit of the three principles that I I guideline in the lean web. Embracing the platform, keeping things small and modular, and remembering that the web is for everyone. I like Alex's better as a guiding principle for, or guiding principles rather, for our profession. In particular, item number two, user experience over developer experience, resonates so deeply with me. So many of the bad patterns and inaccessible approaches I see on the web today are born out of prioritizing developers over the people that use what we build. That's ass backwards. Item number three, uh, web percentages. So important, Uh, web performance percentages. I also really like number four, expanding access to what we build. The web is for everyone and far too many developers seem to have forgotten that or never learned it in the first place. So that's it for today. Let's make 2020 the year that you become a JavaScript pro. Head over to VanillaJSAcademy.com to learn more about the VanillaJS Academy, my project-based online training program starting on January 6th. And don't forget, you can take 30% off with the code podcast at checkout. See you next time. Cheers.